This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. More reality and less Hollywood, the real life of a medical examiner. Dr. Gary Cumberland on this edition of Conversations. In many ways, it is a topic we avoid, but deep down, we seem to have an insatiable curiosity about death, especially when the cause is not easily identified. Television shows and movies add to the intrigue. But what is it really like being a medical examiner? In his book, My Life with Death, Memoirs of a Journeyman Medical Examiner, Dr. Gary Cumberland gives us an intriguing and informative look at his former career. Dr. Cumberland worked as a forensic pathologist for over 25 years, both in the public and private sectors. During that time, he performed well over 4,000 autopsies, with nearly 400 of those being homicides. We're glad to have Dr. Gary Cumberland on this edition of Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. Why did you, first of all, why did you choose this area of medicine to practice? Well, it's a, it's, it's a standing joke with my wife and I is that I have backed into everything in my life. And when I went to medical school, I was going to be a family practice doctor. That's what the school, you know, wanted everyone who went to be because they needed primary care doctors in Illinois where I went to school. And so when I was doing my pathology portion of medical school, I really liked pathology. And then as I got into the rotation, the clinical rotations, I realized that I really didn't like dealing with sick people too much. <laughs> and so then I had to figure out what I was going to do uh, in order to keep the medical degree in practice. And, and pathology seemed like a good way to do it. So while I was in Mobile doing a regular pathology residency, Dr. Leroy Riddick was hired by the state of Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences to set up a medical examiner system in the area. And once I started working with him a little bit on weekends, I just kind of fell in love with it. And so after that, it was just my lot was cast. I was going to do it regardless. For those who don't know, kind of describe what a pathologist does. Well, a pathologist is it's a specialty in medicine, just like cardiology or pediatrics or internal medicine. We deal with the actual diagnosis of disease and injury. Most pathologists work in a hospital. They're the ones that look at the tissue that comes out of surgery. We're the ones who say whether it's cancer or not, whether the margins of the resection are free of tumor, and make the initial diagnosis. And we also run the laboratory. And then part of that is also doing autopsies of people who die in the hospital. And so what happened over the years was that the law enforcement needed someone to look at cases that died under suspicious circumstances, and so they started pulling in hospital pathologists to do it. Well, they neither had the time nor really the, uh, the, uh, the interest to, to maintain it, and so it started developed into its own subspecialty. So what you have to do is you have to go through all the pathology training, it's a four-year program uh, after medical school, and then do one or two more years of forensic after that to, in order to be board certified in forensic pathology. And of course, most people are familiar with it because of the television shows. And I, I'm old enough to remember, like for example, Quincy, Quincy on tel yeah. television. <laughs> In fact, when I first started thinking about writing this book, my thought was I was going to say, going to say no, I don't watch Quincy. Was going to be the name of the book. <laughs> but by the time I finally got it finished, I realized no one was. Everyone was so young now that no one would know what Quincy was anymore. <laughs> so it wouldn't make any sense to them. But I tell people if if they really want to know what I do did as a profession, watch NCIS, I'm Ducky, Dr. Mallard. He, he is as close to a forensic pathologist in real life as I've seen on any of the TV programs. Uh, okay. Well, why did you decide to write the book? Well, it, you know, people were always interested in it. We all, as you said in the opening, you know, we all have this interest in death, particularly if it's a death that has occurred, occurred that it has some law enforcement feelings to it, whether someone's responsible for killing another person or not. And so I was always being asked by people at parties and social things, you know, well, what's the story on that case? Well, you know, while it's actively going on, you can't say anything because it's under investigation. So, you know, I, I finally got to the point where I said, people really don't know what I do. They don't really understand it. So I thought I would sit down and try to write a book that not only gave them some basic facts of what I did as a medical examiner, but also uh, make it entertaining as much as I could along the way. And so there's some things in there that are kind of funny uh, that, it, that happened, funny circumstances. There are things that are very, very sad and very tragic, obviously. But hopefully when they're done reading the book, they'll understand what the job of a medical examiner is. And fortunately, it's not all the glamour that they show on TV. Most of it is, is routine, sometimes to the point of almost being boring. But it's, 
those cases that start out initially just to be straightforward and then something happens that make you realize that there's something else going on that really make it fun a fun job to do. Yeah. What, what, what constitutes um, the reason that an autopsy would be done? Well, anyone who dies outside the care of a physician who's willing and able to sign their death certificate, most of the time it's outside a hospital setting, so that if you die at home and your primary care doctor isn't treating you for some terminal disease of some sort, then you automatically get referred to the medical examiner's office. Then we, as a medical examiner, look at your case, we pull your medical records, we do all the background, and if you don't have a good reason mm -hmm. medically to have died, then you get put into the autopsy queue. And uh, sometimes we just do an external examination of the body just to make sure there are no injuries, because people with terminal illnesses can also be uh, killed. Wow. But we look at the bodies externally, draw some blood for toxicology, and then uh, if, if everything looks okay, then we'll release it to the funeral home. Uh, but if not, and if there's a, even a question about how the person died, then we do a complete autopsy. And, and how long does that process usually take? Yeah, three to four hours, you, okay. is, you're completely done. So, I mean, if you have, uh, most people you know, on television, they see one case, you know, right, and, right. and they get it solved within an hour. Uh, but yeah. unfortunately, real life is not like that. So you have, you know, sometimes four or five a day that you have to do. And so it could be kind of a long day, kind of like doing this. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. But, but, but you're saying a lot of it is routine, so if someone had some sort of disease and they died at home, you would just make sure that nothing make, suspicious had happened. That's gone, right. Had, had and then, on. you know, it, people who die at home, you know, they, if you, got, you might have family members who want them to die quicker than, you know, that they're actually dying. And so that's why we do the toxicology on everyone, just okay. to make sure there's no poisons or no drug overdoses that have been slipped in on them. So, I mean, it's... it's uh, it's an interesting career and it's an interesting job. Um, it makes for great dinner table conversations. Sure. My kids have heard everything, <laughs> everything and anything there is to hear about death. Oh, I can imagine. Well, let's go to the to the next step, though. When something uh, heinous occurs or a crime or something like that, mm -hmm. take take me through the process of how how that works. So law enforcement contacts you. Would you would you go on 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 the scene? Or? Yeah, and it usually happens. Um, <clears throat> Death like that usually occurs on the weekends, so which is, makes your wife and family happy. And it also occurs in the wee hours of the night. And so the, the phone rings at 2 or 3 in the morning, and you get the call and, and from one of the law enforcement uh, offices, usually the sheriff's department or the city police, and they say, we've got a suspicious death, and we need you out there. So then you get up, get dressed, and you go out, and you do a scene analysis with the crime scene uh, people. You know, each of the law enforcement agencies have their own evidence collection teams. So we work with them. We're responsible for the body itself, but they're responsible for collecting all the trace evidence that is sometimes more important than the body at those things. So we help them determine uh, initially what, what uh, we think the uh, cause of death is, and most importantly for them, give them a time frame to work with. How long has the person been dead? Uh -huh. And that can be dicey sometimes to be able to come up with that, particularly here in Pensacola where it gets so warm that the body starts decomposing fairly quickly in this hot, humid environment. How, how would you determine how long someone has been? Well, there are different ways to do it. There, there are the classic ways, that, and if you read my book, I'll go through all, I go through all these things. That's a little teaser to get people yeah. to buy the book. <laughs> but you know, we go through the rigor mortis, the, the liver mortis, which is the blood that settles after death. It gives kind of a purplish hue at the dependent portions of the body. And then we go by algor mortis, which is just temperature. And that's probably the one that they see on TV all the time. They always, uh, you see Ducky sticking a thermometer into the liver and they'll say, he holds it up and he goes, he's been dead for, you know, 45 minutes or two and a half hours. It's not quite that easy, but that is one of the ways that we use to make that determination. Interesting. So you would be called on this. What if it's a crime scene where it was just very obvious, where somebody just obviously you know shot someone? Now, would you be called in on something like that, or it depends on the comfort level of law enforcement. Sometimes they'll call me up and they'll they'll explain to it. And, and the way that I had the office organized when I was working here in Pensacola was I had investigators who worked for me exclusively for me. So they would initially take the calls on a lot of these cases and then they would make a decision whether they needed to go to the scene, whether they needed to go and call me in the process that we both go to the scene. So there is kind of a, a decision tree that we went through. Uh, there were certain cases that they knew that if they didn't call me to it, that, that they were going to be in big trouble. One of them is uh, something that's got a political overtone to it. Uh, the other one was whether there are two or more people that had been killed. And then probably the most important 
if there was assistant state attorney at the scene, I wanted to be there, oh, you know, okay. just just uh, for political reasons, if for no other reason. Interesting. And and once you go to the scene and sort of check everything out, and then I'm assuming the body is so then transported to a lab, and right. and then what happens at that point? You start the process, I guess. We do. It's, it's it's interesting. We, the the uh, autopsy facility for the medical examiner's office here in Escambia County is at Sacred Heart Hospital. And Sacred Heart Hospital graciously put in uh, a uh, morgue facility because the facility that we had to work with over at University Hospital back in the old days was just totally inadequate. And so uh, they uh, they asked me if, if uh, since our since my our private group worked at Sacred Heart, it was convenient for it to be there. So we uh, we had the county approach them about putting the morgue in the basement. And so it, when when uh, they started to do that, I had done this same design process in Mobile before I came here. So I had also worked with hospital administrators before. And so when I designed the uh, the facility there, I, I made it twice as big as I really needed it to be. and. It was really hilarious because they gave me everything I asked for. So we now probably have one of the nicest morgue facilities in the southeast United States. It's going to be big enough and well designed uh, to the point that it'll last another 50, 60 years without any trouble. Wow. Now, when you do an autopsy, for example, was, is it something you would work on by yourself? Or are there a couple of doctors working on it? Or how? It's, it's usually one physician, and then we have, um, it's classically known as a diener, which is uh, German for servant, but it's, it's just an assistant, autopsy assistant. And uh, they uh, work with us and, and do the autopsy. The, the autopsy itself is really kind of physically demanding because you're moving the body and having to do a lot of lifting and moving. So you need someone who's fairly strong uh, there to help you to do a lot of that. But it's, it's one physician, usually one autopsy assistant, and then all the law enforcement that are interested in seeing what the autopsy shows. And, and when we say autopsy, what exactly is that? I mean, we haven't... You know. Yeah, well, the autopsy is really two different, two separate parts. There's the first part we call the external examination, which in forensic is very important because the external surface of the body is where you come in contact with the environment. It's where the bullet hole is to give you an idea of the distance of the gun from the body. It's where all the injuries that occur <clears throat> if it's blunt force injury. And so you get a lot of information, a lot of trace evidence from the external surface of the body. So we go over the body very carefully externally, removing the clothing, collecting the, the trace evidence as we go along. And then after we finish that, we do a part what we call the internal portion, where we make incisions through into the chest, the abdomen, and also into the head, and remove the organs one by one. Again, look at them for any signs of disease or injury, and uh, document that, and uh, come up with a final report as to the cause and, and the manner of death. Yeah. There is a, some, I'm interested to get your, your thoughts on this. The, you know, there's been an awful lot of talk here in recent years about um, concussions in football. Yes. And um, so it's my understanding that there was, uh, I guess, a medical examiner, I believe, in the Pittsburgh area that discovered the chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Correct. If I have that yeah. correct. In you do. the Mike Webster, who was the famous center for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, your thoughts on that's kind of interesting that 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 was discovered in in that sort of way. I guess. Well, isn't you know, it? if or? if you look at the history of medical science, most of the really breakthroughs that occur in medicine has been based on pathology. And so one of the things that, uh, that, that has been a major complaint from the medical community is that the uh, number of autopsies that are being done on people is going down on hospital cases. They're not, they're not even approaching the families to ask for permission. If a person dies within the hospital, I need to make this clear, they have to ask the family's permission to do the autopsy. If it dies and becomes a medical examiner's case, they don't, they're not asked. We just go ahead and do it. Because in a certain percentage of those cases, the person you're asking is the person who did it. And so you, know, you, wanna, you can't ask them to, they won't give you permission to do an autopsy if they're the ones who killed the person. Right. So um, because of the decreasing number of autopsies that are occurring, we're, we're starting to miss some things that, that otherwise medical science would be able to pick up. That is a classic example of that. That has been going on for years. I mean, clinically, Physici uh, physicians have known about it, particularly a neurologist, but until he took the time to actually do the examination and do the special stains on the brain tissue that he needed to do to make the diagnosis, no one had even thought of it. So, uh -huh. so that was a real breakthrough, was my huge, point. Huge. It's yeah. a huge breakthrough, and uh, one of the problems that that uh, medicine has with concussions is, by definition, 
a concussion is a disruption of the function of the brain without any uh, anatomic abnormalities. And so, if say, if you had a concussion and you died from a gunshot wound to the chest at the same time, if I examined your brain, I, it would be completely normal. It's only the repetitive injury that occurs over time that causes the axons in the brain to be torn and to retract and to cause a fibrosis uh, that takes years to develop that uh, you actually start seeing the chronic uh, brain uh, syndrome that they were talking about in the movie. Mm. Interesting, interesting. You mentioned about talking about the, the person in the family that would have to give permission for someone to have an autopsy, and oftentimes they're the one that have, the ones that have killed them. Right. Uh, uh, does that happen a lot? Well, of course, I mean, if you look at homicides in general, uh, probably about 80 to 90 percent of them are committed by someone who is very intimate with the person who died. And so, if you just look at the statistics, then sure, you know, a large percentage of those are going to be uh, husband or wife. You know, domestic violence is a big issue uh, when it doesn't progress to homicide, but there is a, a significant number of those that do, and so it ends up being the husband or the wife who's responsible for the death of the other person. Really? Interesting. Yeah. And, and, uh, but that, uh, that's a good thing in a way, too, because it makes them easier to solve. Uh, yeah. that, the, the, real, the real tough cases are those are the Bundy-type cases where you have someone who just comes in and kills someone just at random, and you have to try to figure out you know, not only how they died, but who's the person who committed that crime. That's where the trace evidence and the crime lab really comes in uh, to uh, affect to, to make that possible. What's the most difficult case you ever worked on? Well, you know, there's difficult um, from an intellectual point of view, but there's also difficult from an emotional point of view. Mm -hmm. Probably f the, the case that comes to mind uh, emotionally is the case of Susan Morris, who was the young co-ed that was killed out at University of West Florida. Just, again, that was one of those cases where a guy comes into town, randomly picks her up and kills her. And her body, you know, she was missing for a couple days and there was a big search for her and, and found her body there on campus in a shallow grave. And, you know, here's this girl who's just a gorgeous young girl. She's uh, a stellar student. You know, the, you know the, she's the type of, of young woman that anyone would claim, you know, as their daughter in ACEs. And, just one day she goes to a class at night and just disappears and doesn't come home. And uh, the next thing the family knows, she's dead. And so, I mean, that's, those are the type of cases that just kind of tear your heart out. Mm -hmm. uh, the other type that was emotionally draining were the sudden infant death syndrome cases. Because again, you have parents who are happy to have this little baby and it's a little bundle of joy and, and they wake up one morning and the baby is just dead in the crib for no apparent reason. So. Now, is that still a big problem? I know there's been a lot of education and outreach yeah. in that area. It's, it's, it, that is one of the most amazing things that has happened during my career is, is the decrease in the number of sudden infant death syndrome cases. When I first started, particularly during the winter months, it was not unusual to have one a week really? in Mobile and even here in Pensacola it was the same thing. And then the pediatrician started talking about flipping the baby over onto their back, which intuitively as a parent, and, and as I was raised my kid, you would think that's the worst place in the world to put them because if they bring up you know, the food, if they regurgitate, it's gonna go down in their lungs. But in point of fact, by flipping them over on their back, it caused the incidence of SIDS to drop probably 80%. Wow. J just overnight. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, you, you, we were talking about challenging cases and you talked about it from an emotional standpoint. What's been the most challenging case you worked on just from trying to figure out what happened? I, had, I was involved with the uh, William Cybers case, who was the medical examiner in Panama City. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a question about, he, is, uh, he was the medical examiner over there, and his wife died suddenly and unexpectedly without a really good medical history. And he, in turn, released her to the uh, funeral home where she was embalmed. And then the, the law enforcement community kind of got word of it. And, you know, she didn't go, he didn't go through the proper channels with the medical examiner's office. So as a result, they had to ship the body over here uh, to, to have an outside forensic pathologist do the case. And so I was the one who had the joy of doing that. And that case went on for years. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure what the answer to it really is. In my heart of hearts, based on everything that I had from an investigative as well as a forensic pathology point of view, I think he was responsible for her death. But we never did have quite the level of proof that we needed to, uh, to make the conviction stay. Now, he did get convicted at one point and then it was appealed and it was overturned and so it went through the system over and over again and, and went on for about 
10 or 15 years. Wow. Well, what about suicides? Do you see a lot of that? Suicides, you know, particularly during the holidays, you know, when everyone else is, you know, everything is supposed to be joyful and everything, the, the suicide rate goes up because there are people out there who are just lonely and they're seeing all their friends and peers, you know, going to visit family and stuff and they have no one. And so the suicide rate does tend to go up during that time. They are probably the most difficult, one of the most difficult types of cases to investigate because by definition you have to prove that uh, they had intent to take their own life. And so if someone is taking pain medication for a chronic pain condition and they take too many pills and die, I have to, in my own mind, figure out whether they intended to do that or whether they didn't. If it was an accidental overdose, then it's an accidental death. But if, if, they, if I can prove that they intended to take the pills, then, then it becomes a suicide. So that not only do you have to figure out why they died, but you have to get into their heads and figure out what their motivation was. And how, how are you able to do that? Well, one of the tricks that we use is, is the amount of drugs they have in their stomach. And so usually if a person is intending to take their own life, they will overdo it. I mean, you'll get into their stomach and they'll just be copious amounts of, of medicine that hadn't been absorbed yet. Whereas someone who is on pain medications and are just having a bad day and are t end up taking more than they should, their stomachs tend to have a little bit, but not nearly the amount that you would expect to see in someone who is intentionally trying to take their life. Mm. What is the most, um, and I guess without getting too graphic here, but what is the most, uh, I don't know, str for lack of a better term, strange or unique way that you have uh, seen someone um, die? What, this, this is a case that occurred in Mobile. It didn't happen here in Pensacola, but it was a, it was a man who wanted to commit suicide, and he had hooked himself up to a timer device to, and put it into an to a outlet in his house and had it set up so that he was hooked up like he was going to be electrocuted with the wires running to his arms and to his leg and it was on a timer so that at a certain time it would kick in and it would electrocute him. So he sat there for at least a period of time to hook, hooking himself up waiting to die knowing that any moment his life was going to be gone. That, that was probably one of the weirdest ones. Wow. And another weird one was a, a guy who uh, committed suicide by hanging himself, and he was into, he was really into pet birds. He had parakeets and parrots and stuff. So we went into his home and found him having committed suicide by hanging, but he had also broken the necks of all of his birds and had suspended them by their necks from their cages. So there are all kinds of weird things that go on and, and it, that, uh, some of which are in the book and some of which I've decided just are best left untalked about. I, I, I want to hit just on a couple of the uh, chapters here and just got to get you to expand on it a little bit. Uh, one, of the, one of the chapters is that uh, things aren't always as they seem, masquerade deaths. What do you mean by right. that? Masquerade deaths are deaths that initially look like one type of death, but they're actually another. And usually we're talking about <clears throat> the circumstances. What initially looks like a homicide is in, and once the evidence is all in, it's actually a suicide. Okay. So that it's a masquerade. You go there thinking one thing and it's actually another. Sometimes it's, it's a good masquerade death because it's, if it's not a homicide, it's a suicide, then you, what the last thing you want is to put an innocent person in jail. But on the other side, sometimes what looks like you know, a straightforward natural death can be somewhere someone was strangled or suffocated or something. And so you initially go in thinking, well, this is going to be an easy one, no problem and you end up getting in much deeper and, and much more difficult case than you initially thought. And I guess sometimes that happens in the reverse way, right, where people try to make it out to be a suicide. It's been a yeah. And, and initially, too, one of the uh, issues that we had for a while was that there's an autoerotic asphyxia type thing, and so people, uh, family members who find someone who has is, who is hanged themselves, kind of like Robin, Robin Williams did, mm -hmm. um, or no, actually it was um, the guy who played Kung Fu, uh, David whatever, I can't think of his name, but he committed, uh, he committed, uh, he killed himself by an autoerotic. They found, people found that if you cut off the supply of air and your oxygen level drops down, the orgasm that you have is much more intense. And so as a result, they usually set themselves up to, to cause constriction on their neck, but there's a fail-safe mechanism. They can pull, a, pull on something and it releases and they fall to the floor unconscious, but they're able to recover. Sometimes that doesn't work. And, and what one of, one of the masquerade type deaths that happens is the family comes in and sees that. There's usually some pornographic stuff laying around. The family's embarrassed by it. 
So they collect all that up. We come in and it's, it's oh, by all intents and purposes, looks like a suicidal death when in fact it's an accidental death. Mm -hmm. That they didn't really intend to take their life. They were just doing something and got, got caught in the circumstances. Just, yeah, just things kind of went, yeah. went, went wrong. Well, it's a fascinating book. How long did it take you to put this together? Well, I, I started writing it uh, a little bit at a time as things came to me. And, and the reason I started, again, was because people kept asking me all these questions. And so I thought, you know, if, if, uh, if I had the opportunity when I got old and gray, which I am <laughs> old and gray, that I was going to put some of these cases together. So I kept track of the cases and, and wrote out some of the uh, synopsis of the cases that I thought would fit into different chapters. And then just over the years, wrote a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. At one point in Mobile, I kind of sent a teaser to a publisher, and he looked at it and he goes, mm, he says, I, I, I don't think it'll sell. And so I said, well, okay. So I came back and I put it on the shelf for maybe 10 or 15 years. And so then I came here to Pensacola and I started collecting more cases and more cases. And I thought, well, you know, by that time NCIS was on, uh, um, uh, the uh, crime scene analysis shows, all of them, you know, NCIS for every city in the country. So it, forensics kind of started catching on with the public. And so my wife said, you know, you really ought to look into writing that book. She said, it may be, may be the time now to do it. And so since I was retired now, I said, oh, I've got the time. I'll sit down and do it. If no other reason, I said, I, my kids will be able to see what I did. Yeah. And what kind of response have you received so far? Um, it's been very good. We had a book signing uh, at the public library uh, the 1st of May, and there was maybe 30 people there at the book signing. So said it was the largest book signing they've had at the public library for any author coming in. So, yeah. so it, you know, it, it's, it's one of those books that it's, with books, anytime I guess with a book, it's publicity is everything. Yeah. And so what I'm hoping is that it kind of is like a, like a stone rolling down the hill that publicity will get uh, bigger and bigger and people will tell people about it and it'll sell. It's not like it's going to rot. So, you know, you know, even if it takes a year for people to start reading it, that's fine. Yeah. And, and is it age appropriate across the board? Well, I, I would probably say late teens okay. would be where I would start. High school kids, um, would, it would be appropriate reading for them. Junior high, if they're a mature kid, they could probably take it. Uh, but grade school, no. Yeah. Okay. Well, very interesting. We wish you the very best of luck with it. It's called My Life with Death. Dr. Gary Cumberland. Pleasure visiting yeah, with you. Thank you for inviting me again. It's been a pleasure being here. Absolutely. Our pleasure. Um, fascinating topic. No question about that. Uh, My Life with Death, Memoirs of a Journeyman Medical Examiner, Dr. Gary Cumberland. By the way, Dr. Cumberland's website is mylifewithdeath.com. And you can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations. We're also on Facebook and YouTube. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.